sitting against the table. Is that it? All right, so everyone, so I love co-induction. I think it's super <laughs> cool. It's like way better than induction in my opinion. <laughs> so Alexander will tell us all about it. Okay, so after this introduction, I'm not sure. Um, so thanks a lot for inviting me to speak here today. It's very exciting. Actually, I was a bit scared when I entered the room this morning. I wasn't expecting to see so many people. Um, th there was one speaker in the morning who mentioned imposter syndrome. I spent the whole morning shaking a little <laughs> bit with the idea I had to give a talk. So but it's very exciting to be here today. So I want to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing in the last couple of years and a bit about co-induction and I will try to make some connections with PL research. Um, I would say in the last five years this has been my life, can be summarized in this triangle. Um, I did a PhD in co category theory and co-algebra um, but always with a focus on automata theory and concurrency theory and then in the last couple of years Nate Foster dragged me to this exciting new field of software-defined networks, and um, this has been my life for the last couple of years. So I want to kind of convince you that co-algebra, so the blue center of my life, is actually a great thing to do. So um, let's see what I can do. So let me, um, I don't know if I'll have time to go through all the slides. Like one speaker in the morning said, I might skip the exciting part of my talk at some point, <laughs> but, um, but let's try. So I want to start uh, with telling you a little bit about Automata. So when I started my PhD, uh, my advisor gave me uh, a book on Automata theory, and I looked at it and said to him, hasn't all been discovered about Automata? Why do you want me to look at Automata? And very quickly I learned that even though automata are such you know, basic structures in computer science, um, and you know, things like language equivalence and so on has been studied for decades, there's still a lot to be discovered. And um, if you look at the POPL um, program from 11, 13, 14, 15, you'll find papers that are uh, still looking at language equivalence for automata, which is you know, surprising. Some things are... Um, very like simple observations that lead to huge algorithmic improvements and that makes it um, kind of a nice data structure to use uh, when you are looking at basic equivalence uh, questions. So there's, I like in particular there's a POPO 13 paper I'll mention later which I think has been um, one of the simplest observations in the last couple of years when it comes to automated theory but led to a lot uh, of new tool improvements and so on. So one first message from my talk, uh, which I'll make again later on, is that sometimes looking at a well-studied problem again with uh, new eyes, young, exciting eyes, can lead to um, new, a new perspective, can lead to a big improvement. So co-algebra and co-induction, I think there was the card, uh, the card that Ross or, or Israel came up with said, the word that it's forbid to use was induction um, because co-induction is usually said to be the dual principle of induction uh, which if I go back to Derek's talk this morning if you introduce it like this it doesn't really say much tell much to the reader so here's how I like to think about co-induction um, co-induction is a proof principle to reason about cyclic structures so if you have a structure that has cycles you most likely will need co-induction to reason about it. Uh, Co-algebra kind of appeared um, as a sub-field of category theory, but in the last few years it made its way to functional languages, to type theory, um, so it has started to pop up in, in PL conferences, and a lot of recent work uh, has been devoted to uniform derivation of algorithms, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in this talk. Um, and a lot of the focus on co-algebra is compositionality, uh, which is a key thing. So if you're, you know, if you're analyzing a problem, let it be equivalence of automata or something else, uh, if you want your algorithm to scale, you want things to be compositional. So a lot of the focus on um, co-algebra and co-induction is about compositional uh, methods. So here's a, a few, I, I picked a few popo papers from the last few years to show you examples where co-induction and uh, co-algebra play a role. Um, I found this paper from 2011 by Fritz and Lass. I couldn't find a picture of Lass. On a regular expression containment. There you go, regular expressions, automata. So it's still something to be said. 
Then there's a, um, a nice paper by Derek and Shankil and uh, Georg and Victor um, on the marriage of bi simulations and cryptological relations. Um, that's Popol 2012. Then Popol 2013, there's this paper by Andreas, Birgit, and some other co authors on co patterns, uh, which basically brought co induction to Agda. Um, and uh, as Andreas likes to say, they did co-induction in a much better way than Koch, the right way. Um, then there's this paper I mentioned before from 2013 uh, by two colleagues of mine, Damian Pus and Filippo Bonchi, on checking uh, NFA equivalence, language equivalence for non-deterministic automata with bi-simulations up to congruence. And this paper, um, Seriously, like the observation, if you see it, and it has been rejected like five times before it got published at Popol, always with the review, this is too simple, someone must have, been, must have done it before. Because the observation that they had was like, was very close, for those of you who know, to Hopcroft and Karp's algorithm from the 70s to check equivalence. And then they added a tiny observation, namely, that if you have a non-deterministic automaton, and if you look at the language, when you do the subset construction to make it deterministic, if you look at the language of a, of a state in this new deterministic automaton, the language is equal to the union of the languages of the singleton states. And this is, everyone knows, this is true, yes? And it's a very simple observation, but somehow it had never been brought into the equivalence checking. So that's what they did, and they had a very, um, Cool implementation of it, and, and it, you know, it could reduce the size of equivalence proofs a lot. And they got this paper into Popo, 2013. And there's a nice communications of ACM, 2015, with a video. This is a picture from that video. Um, then there's here's a paper. It's not a Popo paper, but I like it a lot, so I also put it here. Um, paper by Rustin Leno, who was around. Um, and it's called co-induction simply. And it's basically implementing co-induction in Daphne. Um, so it's kind of bringing co-induction to program verification. And in Popol 2014, there was a paper by Ugo Dalago, Davide San Giorgi, and Michele Alberti on probabilistic programs who are becoming um, rather popular these days. And they were looking at co-inductive equivalences for higher order probabilistic programs. And in Popol 15, there's a um, paper by Nate Foster, Dexter, Cozen, uh, Matthew, Milano, myself, and Lord Thompson on co-algebraic decision procedure for NETCAT. And that's kind of the co-algebra mid software defined networks um, paper. So you see, there's a lot. I mean, I just picked one per year. There were other papers, but I picked one paper um, per year since 2011. And there's a lot of going on on co-induction and, and programming languages, if we um, take this as an example. So what I want to do for the coming uh, 10 minutes is basically to give you a feeling for what's kind of the principle um, behind co-algebra. And then I want to give you one example that's one of my favorite examples on, in which a co-algebraic analysis of a classical uh, al algorithm from automata theory can lead um, to some generalizations. So here's uh, the co-algebraic method in one slide. Um, if you want to specify and reason about systems, and when I think systems, I really think automata or label transition systems or probabilistic automata, then one way to uh, specify the behaviors of such systems is to take a syntax like regular expressions or process calculi. Uh, and maybe you want to reason about them using uh, some axioms. And if you put everything in one slide, uh, you might wonder what is common among these languages? I mean, how did this language came to exist or where do these axioms come from, really? Um, and, you know, people doing co-algebra would ask, can we do this all at once? So is there a way to actually derive axioms and languages uh, and analyze all these systems in one single framework? Uh, so the question is, what do these things have in common? So what do these um, systems have in common? Okay, let's take a DFA, a deterministic automaton. What is a deterministic automaton? It's a set of states and a function that tells you uh, for each state whether the state is final or not, and then for each letter, what's the next state? 
Okay, so what's a um, label transition system? What's the difference? Well, a label transition system is again a set of states and then a function that for each input symbol gives you a possibly empty set of next states or maybe multiple states. Um, and then this thing here is a alternating uh, probabilistic automaton and basically for each state and for each input letter you get a set of uh, next states but the next states are, are taken from a probability distribution. Okay? So um, now that I put everything in one slide, what you have is basically a class of, of models that are all a set of states and then there's a function that gives you a type, T, that gives you basically the dynamics of your system. And the dynamics of the system might be, you know, a deterministic uh, dynamic or maybe a non-deterministic dynamic or maybe even some probabilistic dynamics is involved. And this is what is called a T algebra. And T, the type of the um, uh, dynamics, is very powerful. Um, so actually, just from T, you can derive um, a notion of equivalence, which is usually referred to as bisimulation. So you can derive when two states in, in uh, one of these models denote the same behavior. You can derive a notion of behavior um, that's called the final calls. So for instance, for deterministic automata, the final calls is a set of languages. So it's the behaviors that you can see uh, in a state. Uh, but maybe more surprisingly, you can even derive expressions um, like regular expressions for any of these systems and you can derive the axioms to prove equivalence all for free and for those of you who've looked um, at logic and at axiomatizations um, you might have gone through the pain of proving completeness result for a logic well the nice thing about doing this at once is that then you have a completeness proof for a class of systems and you don't need to redo it um, every time. So the type of the system is, is quite powerful. Uh, and now what I want to show you is that the type is also enough to actually uh, parameterize certain algorithms. So here's one algorithm. I don't know, how many of you have seen Drozowski's minimization algorithm? A few. Okay, not too many. That's good. So here's a, an algorithm uh, that Drozowski came up with in the 80s to minimize an automaton. You take an automaton, possibly non-deterministic, doesn't really matter. You reverse all the arrows in your automaton and you swap initial and final states and then you determinize the thing you obtain and then you take the reachable part and then you do the same again. And magically, the result is minimal in the number of states. And this is really like, <laughs> I mean, first time I saw this, I was like, what? Seriously, I mean, so I did a few examples and it, you know, it gave me the minimal automaton and so I started trusting it and then I did a few more examples and then I decided I had to prove the correctness myself, otherwise I wouldn't um, believe it. So he here's an example so that you believe me with one example, proof by example. Um, so this is a three state automaton and if you stare at it for a couple of seconds, you'll see that um, state X, the initial state, accepts the language of words that finish with an A. So all the arrows with A's here lead to a final state, and all the arrows with B go back to X, which is a non-final state, okay? So this automaton is reachable in the sense that if I start from the initial state X, I can get to any other state. So there are no dead states in there, that's good. But it's not minimal, so actually the, the states Z and Y, they do the same thing. So it's useless to have both of them. One of them would be enough. Um, so here's how the algorithm would, what the algorithm would do to this automaton. So it, we take this guy and we turn everything around. So we basically make the initial state final. We make the final states initial and we reverse all the arrows, okay? Now uh, what we have here is a non-deterministic automaton because like state Y now has two transitions with with A, so we make it deterministic um, using the subset construction. So how does this work? We start with the initial states, we put them together in a set, and then uh, for every letter of the alphabet, we just ask ourselves what can of each of these individual states do here, and we collect everything into a new state. So for instance, Y with A can go to itself and Z, 
and z with a can go to x. So y and z together can go to x, y, z. Okay? And you can do this, and basically, actually, from the new initial state, the only thing you can reach is um, x, y, z and the empty set. All the other states that I drew here in gray, they are not reachable. Um, and if you stare at it, the part that is not in gray, you will see that the new automaton accepts the language A, so all words that start with an A, and then we don't care. So the new automaton accepts the reverse language of what I had before. Um, but more surprisingly, or not, um, it's minimal. So it's minimal for the reverse language. So in other words, the automaton you get in the middle step of Trzoski's algorithm is already minimal, but for the reverse language. And that's basically how you prove correctness. You just prove that the thing you obtain in the middle is minimal for the reverse language. And then since you do it twice, it will be minimal for the reverse of the reverse, which is the language itself. And actually, if you repeat everything I showed for this automaton now, what you get is a two-state automaton that indeed identifies the two states um, that I showed in the first slide. And it is minimal for the original language, namely the words that end with an A. Okay? So it just works. It's like it's a, it's a really nice, um, really nice algorithm. But now the, the question one might ask is, um, is this very specific to deterministic automata? And actually, it's not. So Brzozowski in the original paper already observed this works for non-deterministic automata. Uh, but how about other types of automata, like weighted automata or probabilistic automata? Does this also work? And how? How? I mean, what is, in this algorithm, what is specific to deterministic automata and what is uh, more general? So the crucial um, observation uh, to kind of generalize this, this algorithm is that reverse and determinize, so this, this operation that actually in the original paper is presented as two uh, separate operations. So there's reverse as one operation, then there's determinize as another operation. Actually, and that's why I wrote them in one line, they can be seen as one operation. So you can combine them into one operation. And when you do that, you can actually show that reverse and determinize are an operation that can be derived from the type of deterministic automata. So reverse and determinize is, comes from the type. I'm not telling you how, but trust me, it comes from the type. And once you observe that, you can actually use that to prove the correctness and to generalize this to other, um, to other types of automata. In uh, particular, one thing you can do, you can, uh, the fact that there's a two there, so that final and non-final state, that's completely irrelevant. And you can replace it by any output set. So you would get an algorithm for Moore automata. The fact that uh, you have a set of states is actually happens to also be irrelevant. So you can uh, replace a set by a vector of states. And then you would get what is called in the literature linear weighted automata. Uh, you can even replace it by a Boolean algebra. And then you would get uh, what I call here um, clean algebra with test automata. Dexter calls them guarded automata. And uh, you know you can get all kinds of all, all kinds of things just from that observation. Um, and most you know most of the things you get are just for fun. Uh, but some of the generalizations actually uh, can be used in in practice. So for instance, the generalization to Moore automata um, and to clean algebra with test automata, we've used it in our work in in Netcat for software defined networks. And in some work I did on uh, must and may um, semantics in concurrency theory. So sometimes it's like this little step that gets you um, to more applications. Um, how, how much time do I have, Ross? Uh, five to ten minutes. Five to ten? Oh, that's very generous. Okay, so I can I can say this slide. Yeah. So one of the five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so. This generalization to Moore automata, uh, we've used it uh, to make some connections to um, some work in concurrency theory in most and May semantics, and to capture something that's called in concurrency theory the Van Glabeck spectrum. Um, but more interestingly, so that paper I mentioned from Popol 13 
on uh, the observation for non-deterministic automata that allow them to improve the original algorithm by Hopcroft and Carr. Uh, that paper was also developed from a co-algebraic perspective. And then the fact that we had these two works developed from the same perspective actually allowed us to connect both and get an even uh, more efficient algorithm. And that uh, we actually have a paper at APLAS in 2014 where we show how to combine both algorithms. Um, and this is really, for me, uh, this is where you see the gain in the abstraction. I mean, sometimes it's fun to do category theory just for the fun of it. Uh, but not always, um, and I think really when you when you have new applications for um, an algorithm or, or a new definition you came up with from an abstract perspective, um, that can give you inspiration to generalize other algorithms, and that's kind of when the thing uh, when abstraction pays off. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick two minute. I'm looking at Ross before he gets upset. A uh, very quick two minutes uh, brief on, on how we also used part of this in, in software defined networks. Uh, how many of you know about software defined networks? Okay, that's cool. A lot of people. I don't need to uh, say too much about it. So, um, software defined networks is this new uh, paradigm in, in networking from a couple of, well, from a decade ago, I would say by now, uh, where uh, the control and data planes in the network are um, taken apart. And there's a centralized uh, controller that basically can, has a global view of the network and can react to events in the network. So if a link is down uh, and so on, it can change the policy. And um, a, a lot of work has been devoted in the last few years on devising programming languages to actually program this controller in a high level way. Um, some of that work has been done um, at Cornell, there's this project uh, called Frenetic between Cornell and Princeton and I think some other place. And the core language of Frenetic is called Netcat. It's a language based on regular expressions, which is, um, again, we see automata and regular expressions popping up. Um, and basically, so when SDN was created, a language, a low-level language called OpenFlow was proposed. But you can think of OpenFlow a bit like the assembly of, of networking. And then a lot of work has been put into um, de developing high-level languages that is um, programming of the controller. Uh, so Netcat uh, was developed a couple of years ago, appeared for the first time in Popol 14. Uh, and then a lot of questions about the semantics of the language and how to decide equivalence of policy were left open in, in the original paper. Um, and so, so let me skip this was just an example. Um, so some, some, lang some questions on the equivalence were left open. And then in Popol 15, we um, answered these questions by using results from automata theory, basically. So we realized that the semantics of Netcat, which in the original paper was presented um, in a bit of a um, verbose way using a packet forwarding policy, could actually be reduced to an automata question. So we basically gave an automata semantics um, to Netcat using Moore automata, uh, so automata with output. And based on that, we could um, apply this Brozowski um, algorithm and also some of the up to techniques uh, from that uh, Popol 13 paper uh, to Netcat. So this was kind of a bridge uh, that was built just by using um, this observation from automata theory. Um, there's a lot of exciting research questions to be explored um, in Netcat and, and in, in programming language for software-defined networks. I list a few here in case someone is still looking for a PhD and wants to join us. I have some shameless advertising in a little bit. Um, but so there's a lot of, a lot of open questions that um, we believe can be answered by continuing this exploration of connections between automata theory, programming language semantics, and networks. Um, one of the things we've been looking at recently is probabilistic foundations uh, for software-defined networking. I find this a very exciting, very exciting area. Um, so I'm going to conclude. I'm going to wrap up with a more uh, kind of philosophical um, slide. So as I said, um, I was my PhD was was really in this more abstract area and then along the years I kind of drifted away and went to more practical PL research. Um, 
I still see, I mean, I do see a lot of advantages of the fact that I have a more abstract um, perspective on things. And I think that abstraction can really bring uh, new perspectives and, and, and solutions um, to questions in, in programming languages, in software-defined networks, in concurrency theory. I think we should never forget that um, having a solid foundation is a very important uh, thing if you have a new programming language, if you have a new paradigm. Um, and when you, have, when you try to transfer techniques between areas, this is really a two-way street. I mean, on the one hand, you try to really, I mean, you, you try your best to apply your abstract methods in a practical application, but in the end of the day, usually it doesn't just work. You need to bring the methods that you developed a bit further. So the practical applications give you inspiration for your research. On the other hand, sometimes the abstractions you bring into a more practical application clears up things that the people doing you know, the practical application haven't seen. So there's, a, there's this transference of you know, results and, and techniques that is very valuable, and I think we should um, not underestimate that. And now some shameless advertising. If you're still looking for a PhD or a postdoc position, Nate Foster, um, Dexter Cozen, and myself are uh, hiring. So we have several PhD and uh, postdoc positions at UCL and Cornell. So um, if you're interested, get in touch. Thank you. That's it.